the client was a national sales manager of a big pharma company and her problem was she was very quick to dismiss her peers and her people. Welcome to season three of Conversations with Coaches. This is a stakeholder-centered coaching production where we believe everyone deserves a stakeholder-centered leader. I'm Brandon Murgard, your host for the show. This season, we go deep into the case study library to discuss the real life challenges of leaders and the coaches who help them succeed. As an added bonus, we're giving away the latest installment of our case study library, which includes case study summaries, show notes from each episode, and ways you can connect with the guest. Get your copy today at mgscc.net forward slash case dash studies. Today, we're joined by James Pereira, a coach with a keen eye for the nuances of culture's influence on leadership. In this episode, James shares his insights into coaching a leader through the complexities of power distance in a multinational setting. Discover how James navigated the challenges of national cultural norms to enhance leadership effectiveness and foster a more inclusive feedback culture. Join us as we discuss the power of coaching across cultural boundaries. Come on in and let's find out more about the client. Well, Brandon, uh, let me put this in context. First of all, this was a pro bono uh, case. And uh, this was part of my uh, accreditation to the Marshall Goldsmith National, uh, sorry, Stakeholder Centered Coaching Program. So uh, this was a client with whom I have been doing work over the past few years. So it was easy for me to approach them and uh, explain what was uh, involved. So the managing director was very gracious to say, let's work with the natural sales manager. And he sounded that this was her problem, which was uh, she was a natural sales manager for I think about five to about 10 years uh, or seven years in this role. And because she was so good in the job and she knew the ropes uh, in pharma, and specifically in this mental health sector. She was dismissing her peers, the suggestions from her peers, uh, who were the brand managers. She was dismissing the suggestions of her sales managers, who were the people reporting directly to her, and anybody else who was working with her. So that was the issue that we set out to solve. Okay, so we've got a, a sales manager, seems like a very important individual who's Ego maybe just got a bit farther ahead from her her uh, willingness to take suggestions from others. Now, you had already worked with this client. So what was it like when, you know, as the client, I realized I have a problem. How did I reach out to you for help? Well, uh, uh, let me put this in a bit more context, uh, Brendan. Because I had worked with them in the past and I was conducting um, training programs in sales as well as sales management prior to this engagement uh, in, in stakeholder-centered coaching. I kind of knew her character and that was an issue for me because sometimes you, you, you tend to second guess uh, and you try to throw the solutions at them. To, so I had to train myself. I had to shut myself up and listen more than I speak. So that was a big issue for me. Uh, and, and I have played the role of a sales manager before in a pharma company and brand management. So I could resonate with exactly what she was going through because I had gone through the same uh, problems. So I had to stop myself from giving her advice and really put on my coach hat rather than my mentor's hat. Um, <laughs> so what I did... Uh, uh, Brandon is I, I, I and this because this is this was my very first coaching um, you know system using uh, Marshall Goldsmith's, Goldsmith's process. I followed the steps judiciously. Step one, two, three, four. I did not take any shortcuts because I didn't want to uh, you know fumble along the way. I didn't want to have a bad result that I may have to question and see if I was the cause of, of uh, the bad results. 
uh, what I did was I first the first step was actually conducting a, a briefing with the managing director and the national sales manager, and she was so enthusiastic. That was the biggest surprise. Um, although uh, her boss had had stated that this is the issue, we went through the process, Brenda. We uh, we got input from her and her boss, from her peers, from the people who uh, re- were reporting to her. And uh, I collated the uh, responses and um, I submitted to both the ND and uh, the National Sales Manager. And they selected it. It was not, not me who suggested or highlighted any area for them to work with. Now, uh, that my, my biggest concern was that because I knew these people and I had been working with them uh, you know, for a few years prior to that, I had observed that they, uh, they were a very tight-knit group. They were almost like a family. Uh, it's, it's a very small uh, organization, I think about maximum of 20 people. So you can imagine how close they were. They used to go for lunch together, you know? And that was a worry for me because I was thinking, would they be honest and give their input? Or would they try to sugarcoat everything? And on top of that, being Asians, that's another issue. You know, if you have worked with Asians, you will know that we are very kind. <laughs> we don't like to ruffle any feathers. But the good thing was this was a European multinational company. So, you know, the, 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 the multinational methods of working were there. So, so that, that gave me the confidence that we would get the answers. And sure enough, uh, things came in. Um, and it was, it was nice because everybody trusted me that I was going to be confidential not, and not reveal who said what. Mm-hmm. Well, James, walk me back because, um, you know, you, it sounds like the conversation started on a, let's say, a much higher note than the way most coaching uh, presentations go. So you've sat down with, uh, you know, presumably the, uh, a senior leader there. You've presented stakeholder center coaching. It was well received. Tell me what happened in that conversation, how you presented it to get such an enthusiastic, emphatic response from the client. Um, Brendan, I'm going to be honest here, and this may sound uh, trivial, uh, but I approached the managing director and said, look, um, I need to get my certification in Marshall Goldsmith uh, Stakeholder Center Coach and hopefully deliver deliver better service to you guys. And I said, I need someone pro bono to do the coaching with. And he immediately, I, I was thinking about him, but he suggested his natural sales man. So I said, okay, fine, let's go with that. Uh, and, and, and I did not use any slides, Brandon. It was just a, a conversation where I said, this is what the process is all about. And I was very frank and I told him, I'm not going to be the coach. You guys are going to be the coach. I'm merely a facilitator. So I think he bought into that because it usually when a coach goes in, it is the coach telling someone what needs to be done uh, without any observations. And I've done that kind of coaching before, so I know what the, those issues are. And I think he, he, he and the national sales manager bought into the premise that it is their people who are coaching them and the benefit is that there is something in it for them rather than somebody who's coming in from outside and getting things done and no one knows what. Yeah. So I think that's, that's what sparked the interest. Good. Well, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who are listening at home on your, your daily commute, perhaps at the gym, um, I'm, I'm poking a bit of fun because James is an exceptionally talented sales leader. So whatever he presented is already going to be good. What he's talking about with this pro bono engagement, getting certified, um, is that if you don't know, with our, our certification program, everyone has to produce positive results in a six-month engagement to earn their certification. We have a very, very strong quality control system, but that's why he's presenting it this way to say, I got to get certified. Are you willing to step up and help me? I'll help you. I think that's awesome, James. So they were gung-ho from the beginning. He's already got someone in mind and you already knew this individual and knew what the struggle was, correct? Yes, absolutely. Oh, match made in heaven. Uh, it, was, it was definitely a match made in heaven. I think things flowed so smoothly in that six months. Um, and uh, Brandon, as I was saying, you know, that was the first interaction with uh, 
with the managing director. And then I, I had a separate meeting with just the both of them. And I went through the entire process of what the SCC was all about. Um, and the third step was actually getting all their people on board and having a third session, a third, um, you know, revelation of what uh, Marshall Goldsmith stakeholder centered coaching was. And, um, and then we kicked it off after the national sales manager had revealed to the group. And this was done via a Zoom meeting as well. I insisted that she do it this way rather than through a new personal email. And uh, I think that managed to get the buy-in even more uh, from, from her people, especially from her peers. Um, and I think that kind of assuaged uh, her people as well, those who were reporting to her that this is going to be a birth board as nobody is going to be penalized for voicing out their opinion. Now, having said that, Brendan, what I noticed in the first two months of getting feedback was that it was very oh Um The feedback that people were giving her was that, good job, keep it up. And that's it. There, there were hardly any suggestions on what needs to be done. So I had to, uh, over the next two months, uh, train her, after getting her permission, of course, train her on how to request for better feedback, you know, or rather better suggestions on what needs to be done. So I called her and I, and I reminded her, look, this is typical selling skills that, you know, I had gone through with your team. So now it's your turn to use it with your people. You know, it is sales anyway. So, so she kind of got into that. She bought it. And, and after that, Brendan, the, the, the suggestions came in a lot more um, informative and useful. Can you share with us a little bit about how was she asking for feedback before and then how did you train her to solicit more quality uh, suggestions? Yeah, so um, right from the beginning, I told her, look, there are a couple of ways that you can, you know, get the feedback. Either email the form to them, the feedback form, ask them to uh, give their input, send it back to you. And if you wish, you can, you know, um, have a further discussion with them or meet them along the corridor or when you're going out for lunch with them individually, you can ask them or even pick up the phone. Um, but the very first two months, I think she was kind of hesitant to, to take that route because too much work. And so the easiest is just to email the form and wait for the feedback. So when the suggestions were, were pretty lean, that's when I told her, look, it's better if you pick up the phone uh, all sit down with them and over a five or 10 minute conversation, just dig deeper. And I taught her the technique, which is if somebody says, good job, hey, keep it up. I told her, what you can do is just ask that one question. Look, I need your help. What is the one thing that I can do next month to improve my, uh, you know, to, to, to improve in this behavior? I told her, just focus on the six action steps that you had listed out. Ask them, you know, to focus on any one of these. What can you do better? And that's when the suggestions uh, uh, were flowing much better. And what are these six action steps? Was that part of her action plan or something different? Yes, yes. It was part of the action plan for that behavior, which was to, to you know, listen first uh, before she gives her feedback. So one was... Uh, one was for her to remain silent when somebody is speaking uh, and not to say anything. And, and uh, the first few months, um, Brandon, um, she was still interrupting them. But from the third month onwards, onwards Brandon, something happened in the organization. There was some um, you know, turmoil um, because I think one of their products was not doing well and, and you know, there were some issues with customers. And so the entire organization uh, had to be on their toes. And that's where she really started listening. And that's also when uh, her people, her peers, as well as the sales managers, sounded her every time she interrupted them. You said, um, we have to remind you that this is, this is the action step you said you would be implementing, but now you are not. So, so that, that kind of worked. Uh, and that's where my shock was, uh, Brendan, because you know here are a bunch of Asians who are having their calls, to mind themselves, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good so luck with so that. it works, and, and I think I, and I think my advice, uh, Brendan, to all the people who feel that you know this won't work in Asia, you know, because of the culture issues and all that, I would say, try it out before you say no. James, it's funny you say that. I'm 
I've been working on a leading a large research project to replicate the results in leadership as a contact sport, but sticking the um, national culture's power index, power distance index, to see how that actually moderates the relationship to answer the question, does stakeholder center coaching work better in high power distance cultures, worse, or is there no statistical significance? So we will actually have a pretty a pretty strong empirical answer on that, you know, maybe by mid-2025, stay tuned. But from your perspective, you know, what role would you say the the Malaysian power distance index, which is higher than anywhere in the world, to the best of my knowledge, how would you say that that affected people's willingness to give the feedback as you were talking earlier? Well, Brandon, that was also at the back of my mind when I was doing this uh, session with this group. Uh, and having had work in in um, multinational companies based in Malaysia before, um, I have never had this power distance uh, impact the interactions in any way. So that gave me the confidence as well that this will not be an issue in this organization. And sure enough, um, so I think that, um, and again, as you said, there is no empirical evidence behind this. But I tend to think that if it is a multinational organization, whether it's European or American or Australian or any other part of the world. Uh, I mean, uh, or um, any one of these three, uh, let me say, English-speaking uh, cultures. I work with the non-English-speaking cultures as well, and, and I can tell you that there are some issues. But if it is an English-speaking uh, culture, um, there is no issue because that working culture will override the national culture, which is what you had mentioned, the power distance, and basically, I think, reporting or just um, assessing the uh, national culture, uh, and that is superseded by the corporate culture, and everybody has to, you know, play that role, um, live within that corporate culture. They are core values rather than the values of the of the nation. James, you're right. There is not an empirical standing in the literature yet. We're hoping to make that contribution and ho hopefully set the stage for future researchers to continuously move the needle on these questions about how culture affects the outcomes. Um, but uh, uh, the late um, the late David Peterson at Google, I believe, the executive director of the executive coaching programs put in hypothesized in his published work that exactly what you said, when you have a strong organizational culture, it absolutely supersedes the national culture and the organizational culture, regardless of where the organization tends to be, he's suggested um, actually defaults largely to the national culture of the founder. And so there's a lot of variables at play here. We're going to take the best cut at this we can, um, but I, I tend to agree with you. I think that the, I think there won't be a strong effect. What I will say is that in the leadership as a contact sports study, which is now more than a quarter million respondents, the results were stronger in Asia than they were anywhere else. Now they were also more represented in the data, um, but that's that's the big question that was left hanging by Marshall Goldsmith and Howard Morgan. That hopefully we're gonna hopefully we'll contribute to. But you're there. You're doing it. You're seeing it. Um, and it sounds like our, our suppositions are in alignment. Coming back to this client. So you've been, you've sat down, you've explained the process. They've put you in place with this leader. It's been a rocky first three months. Some crisis occurs. And now people are actually coming up to her and saying, oh, 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 oh you interrupted me. I've got to point this out to you. What was the experience of the leader having her stakeholders come up to her and in interrupt her to say, wait, let me finish. What was her experience having her stakeholders do that to her? Um, Brandon, she was fine with that. You know, she is a go-getter. Uh, I would say a very assertive, maybe even aggressive personality, but she was fine in receiving this feedback. No issue for her. So so I, th I think... Um, um, uh, again, this this probably is related to what you, we had we just been discussing about the power distance. Had no issue here, no role at all. It didn't impact the interaction. And 
How about the relationships between her and her stakeholders? Did you see that change over time once they felt safe to actually speak out? Uh, yes, I think uh, it, it definitely uh, was boosted and they became uh, a lot more uh, closer from these interactions because they kind of knew where they stood, they stand with her now as opposed to the past. In the past, they may have you know, refrained from, from speaking out. But mm -hmm. now they knew that they had the license from the managing director himself. <laughs> so they used this opportunity to speak their mind. And what also happened, uh, Brandon, is that interestingly, from the third month onwards, um, she reported, her sales manager reported that her peers in their respective teams, uh, they were modeling this process with their teams. And their team, uh, the national sales managers reps, were also using the same system with their respective bosses. Although it was not formalized in any way, but they were using that informally. Yeah, that's, that's such a cool thing about stakeholder-centered coaching when you say, James, here's what I'm working on. Do you have suggestions? Thank you for the suggestions. By the way, is there anything you want to get better at? Anything I can share with you to help you on your own improvement journey? It's very collaborative and you build almost like little networks of, of feedback, feed forward pipelines. You know, talking further about the results, um, I know that you measured these with the, the mini survey that looks at uh, the changes that people see in the leader's overall effectiveness on a minus three to plus three scale. What kind of results did we see in the, the survey? Um, so Brandon, this was also a shocker for me because um, being Asians, I thought that they would be, you know, giving a, her the maximum marks. But no, I was expecting her to at least cross a two, between a two and a three. But what she only received was a 1.86 plus 1.86. So I felt that, okay, this must be real results. This is not made up not polished in any way, you know, they did not massage anything. So these were genuine and I was pretty happy uh, with that. And I asked her, how do you feel that you got, you know, only a 1.86, possibly 1.86? She said, she herself said she was expecting a lower result. So, you know, that's, that's, uh, that was her perception. So she was pretty, pretty pleased with the 1.86. Yeah, you know, that's, uh, that's par for the course. I believe that's roughly average in our, our research data set. But, you know, I, I like to remind people two things. One is any positive score is progress. That's progress. 1.8, 1.5 is 50% up the positive scale. There's a really good improvement to make in just three months, in just six months, however long you, you go to get this. But the other thing is that there is latency between behavioral change and perception change. You might have been working really hard at something for six months, but it might take people nine months to fully see what you've done in those six months and to really believe that it's it's sticking. What else? What other things were you noticing were changing in the relationships or in the organization as this leader continues to improve? Besides this, um, uh, I, I also observed, uh, Brenda, and this was after the, the interaction with the sales manager had ended, because I had another project that I did with them. And what I realized was that the interaction between the marketing team and the sales team had improved tremendously. Previously, they, were, they used to be at log edits, but now they could, you know, lay things on the table and discuss openly and, and you know, criticize the plans without criticizing the person. So I think uh, the level of maturity in the organization was raised yeah. as well. And did she have stakeholders that were in the marketing team or did this just sort of happen organically? Yes, uh, her peers were actually from the marketing team. Amazing. So we're breaking down silos yeah. with this. Yeah. So a huge, huge benefit to the leader, huge benefit to the stakeholders, huge benefits to the organization. Let's zoom in on James. You are... Um, a trainer, a co you have many titles, well-educated, well-credentialed. What were, what were your key takeaways from this particular engagement? Hey, uh, Brendan, the first thing I would say is don't assume that, you know, things will go a certain way, whether positive or negative. Just go with the flow. Just, just go through the process from step one to what, how many steps you have there. Uh, and I, I would suggest that 
um, get everybody involved because the more people you get involved uh, right from the beginning, the better the buy-in and uh, the more assurance they get that, you know, this is not going to be uh, an avenue for the management to pick on someone who they don't like. So I did not see this in this organization. So I would say that. Now, the other thing that I also learned is that um, before I give any, gave any feedback to this natural sales manager, I asked her permission because she, had, she is a person with a lot of experience. So I had to treat her at my level. Um, and, you know, um, uh, as, as a fellow peer rather than a coach coachy relationship. And I asked her, do you mind if I give you some suggestions of how you could get something done? And she was open to it. Now, obviously, if somebody is not open to it and you try to shove things down their throat, it's not going to be uh, swallowed at all. So, so, so I think, yeah, that, that's, that's something that I, you know, I, I really learned. And I think the biggest learning, um, Brandon, is that having been um, you know, um, at the top of the corporate uh, game, uh, there was a study which I read that within 15 seconds, of a leader hearing somebody else, whether it's a peer or one of their people, they will interrupt. So I had to struggle with that and train myself not to interrupt and not to give suggestions and advice. And I've told myself, I'm a coach. I got to ask empowering questions. So that's what I did. Uh, Brendan, I asked a ton of questions because each time she, uh, during the, I, I call it a debrief, I don't call it a coaching session every month. Because I didn't want them to feel that I'm the coach. Because I had told them I'm not the coach. I'm just a facilitator. So I told her, look, I'm, I'm, this is what I'm going to be doing. So each time at, at the end of the month when we have our interactions, she would say, I'm going to be doing this because of this, this, this. And I would challenge her, how do you know that this, this, this and this is, is your premise, uh, your, your platform to work on? And any other suggestion, I would, I would check, check her and ask, how do you know that's going to work? Do you have contingencies? You know, um, what happens if this fails? Because I'm going to be meeting you only 30 days from what happens in between. Now, of course, I told her that you can email me, you can call me anytime. But I, but I was preparing her to handle whatever, um, you know, uncertainties that may come up. You know, a key factor of stakeholder-centered coaching is the time efficiency. We want to work with busy people because busy people are making the world turn. What did you learn Given that this was your first time actually applying stakeholder center coaching, what was your experience with the time efficiency aspect of it? Um, Brandon, I was terribly inefficient. <laughs> the, the very first, the, during the very first knee break, we took one and a half hours, Brandon, uh, and then we learned together. Together, both of us learned how to uh, shorten the process. And the, uh, towards the final two months, we just took 15 minutes, Brandon. Because I was coaching her on how to get things done faster. And she was also coaching me. She was training me how to get things done faster as well. And she suggested, why don't I send you, you know, the, the input uh, a week before our session. So at least you can, you know, read through and pick up whatever needs to be you know, discussed. Uh, and I said, fine. Um, and that's how we ended up with just 15 minutes, uh, Brendan. So, so I think, yeah, going through, uh, uh, you know, this iterative process, will teach you how, where to find the shortcuts as well. Um, and, and, you know, we, we learn uh, in order to get feedback, instead of just using the form, they use WhatsApp, uh, they use the phone, they, they were meeting along the corridors whenever they got the time, instead of just waiting towards the end. Because in a sales organization, the final week is the most important. So everybody is busy closing the sales. So, so it's a time crunch there. So that's how they learn to work within uh, the time frame. Well, you know, if I'm a coach and I'm helping people with these challenges, if I'm a sales leader or an organization with sales leaders with similar challenges, what could I learn from your engagement? You know, what, what key takeaways could you share with me that I could go out and action? Uh, first and foremost, I would say, Brendan, have an open mind. Don't have preconceived notions of anything. Uh, going with an open mind. Uh, going with, with, with the mentality of, you know, going with the flow rather than sticking, you know, rigidly uh, to, to certain, you know, frameworks and stuff like that. So that, that would be point number one. 
Point number two, uh, being a coach, um, you know, means that we have to ask a lot of empowering questions. We got a challenge. And I think that's that's the second thing, uh, most important. Uh, besides empowering questions, is challenging people. Sometimes we feel that, you know, we should not challenge and just accept their viewpoint. But I, I believe that when you challenge them, it, it makes them think. And therefore, they are empowered through their thinking rather than us giving them the answers and um, use technology Brendan that's uh, point number three I would say that you know especially and, and I'm I prefer to use zoom I'm not good with Microsoft teams uh, or other platforms and I learned zoom because now with the AI tools that come with zoom uh, and also the add-ons uh, you can click whatever you wish and you can share it with them which I do uh, with with all the uh, people that I coach now using the SCC, I send them tips or important points for them to remember that they have said that they will do. So it's kind of a reminder for them, you know, small uh, chunk size uh, le- uh, lessons for them. And uh, finally, what I uh, would also um, emphasize on is at the end of the meeting to to get them to summarize their action steps for the next month. What they have learned and what they need to do. Because when they summarize, they will remember. Um, so I think that that these are the powerful lessons that I have learned and I would advise others to implement as well. Excellent. Well, James, our audience is going to be interested to know more. How can they get in touch with you, follow your story, reach out? Um, Brendan, there are two ways that they, they can contact me. One is on LinkedIn. I'm, I've got a, I was, uh, you know, I'm quite active on LinkedIn. So if they were to search for producing profitable people, um, they will find me there if they're just typing that. Or they can email me at James Pereira at loud lion.com. James Pereira took us on a deep dive into the complexities of coaching in a multicultural context. James's approach to overcoming cultural barriers and leveraging organizational culture for leadership success offers invaluable lessons for coaches and leaders alike. We hope you're inspired to explore the dynamic interplay between culture and leadership in your own practice. Remember, all the case studies of this season are available for download at mgscc.net forward slash case dash studies. The link can also be found in the episode description. And if you'd like to better understand the foundations of leveraging stakeholders and measuring results in your coaching, then join the free training program, Foundations of Stakeholder-Centered Coaching, where we share the philosophies and frameworks that guarantee improved leadership effectiveness in 12 months or less. You can register for the free course at mgscc.net forward slash foundations dash course. Until next time, this has been another episode of Conversations with Coaches by Stakeholder Centered Coaching, where we believe everyone deserves a stakeholder centered leader. Thank you for joining the conversation and stay tuned for more stories of leadership transformation.